Howdy, 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 and welcome to the Red Dirt Aggie Show. I'm Brian, a.k.a. the Red Dirt Aggie, and uh, I am here live with the Limestone Kid, the Gold Chain Cowboy, Parker McCollum, whatever you want to call him, but he's here. <laughs> What's up, Brian? Thanks for having me, bro. Yeah, man. No, uh, we're we're excited to have you here on the pod. The the hashtag Parker on the pod campaign came true, so it's all it's all good. I'm sure you yeah, got it right from. I don't know how many days it was, but eventually I was like, all right, these boys are pretty <laughs> consistent. So, oh man, I, seriously, gotcha. thanks for having me. Yeah, man. Uh, so the the limestone kid nickname. Uh, I know I know you're a Conroe guy, right? But um. Did Limestone County come into play or anything? Limestone? It was, yeah. My, my granddad was uh, breeding quarter horses my whole life. And um, I worked for him, cowboyed for him for a long time. And uh, his main headquarters was in uh, a little bitty town outside of Grosbeck called Big Hill. It's not even a town, but it has a little sign. There's no store. There's no stoplight. There's no really nothing <laughs> but, you know, uh, four ranchers where two roads meet. So it's four corners, four pieces of property meeting up. And uh, there's a little A-frame right right uh, there on the corner, not far from the road, and a uh, big old feed silo and a um, big barn. And uh, he had a he owns a bunch of land in Stranger as well, which is um, right next to there. But uh, I spent a lot of time in Limestone County and growing up in Cowboy for my granddad. And, you know, kind of the best years, you know, of my childhood and the best times of my childhood right. were spent there working for him. And, you uh, you know, I'd, I'd kind of had the idea for several years in high school. I wanted to you know, start a band called the Limestoners. <laughs> and uh, I actually looked on Reverb Nation when I was probably 20 years old. And there was, or I just typed it in on Google and something came up on Reverb Nation. It was like this, <laughs> you know, like soft rock band where these real old guys started a band called the Limestoners. <laughs> so it was taken. And, uh, you know, and so I kind of shifted to the Limestone Kid, kind of got the inspiration. You know, Rodney Krause's record, The Houston Kids, one of my favorite albums of all time. I was obsessed with Billy the Kid, um, King Griffey Jr., who was the kid. Uh, Brett Favre was the comeback kid. I was just always thought that was – always kind of stood out to me. And, and uh, so the Limestone Kid kind of came about, you know, through that. Well, that's uh, that's interesting you mentioned Grosbeck because you don't hear about it much. But I've uh, no. I got some family that's got a lake house up there on Lake Limestone. So yeah. that's why I, I hear Limestone and I'm like – Wait a minute. Why does that sound familiar? But... I spent a lot, a lot of time there, man. I, I love that part of the state. Yeah, we used to have a uh, family deer lease up there around that area around Gros Bay. So yeah, it's pretty good deer there. hunt now. I mean, when I was growing up, it really wasn't that great. But now, I mean, there's, there's, it's pretty. It makes it a lot better in East Texas. <laughs> well, and uh, so I, I have seen, you know, on your social media and stuff, you are a hunter. Um What's probably the best hunt you've ever been on? Man, um, or... You know, I did a mountain lion hunt at the Ot Six Ranch uh, a couple years ago. That was pretty phenomenal. You're running with bloodhounds. I think we tracked this lion for three days, um, and uh, uh, finally treated him. I think at you know ten, fifteen minutes left of daylight on the third day. And uh, you know, growing up hunting in Texas. You always hear about mountain lions, you know. You never, yeah. you never see one. Hardly, very, very few people <laughs> have actually seen one. So I had never seen one in person. They were kind of like, you know, kind of like a, a mythical figure to me growing up hunting. Right. <laughs> always hear my dad talk about them and stuff, and then so to finally get to shoot one and and uh, see one up close was was pretty awesome. Yeah, man. This <laughs> this big cats are beasts. <laughs> Yeah, it's. I mean, it's my favorite animal by far. And there's, you know, a lot of people kind of have a bad taste in their mouth or a bad rep for hunting them. But, you know, like I killed this really old tom, and these old toms will breed these um, females, and then they'll yeah. go eat the cubs to, and then bring the female back in heat. She'll reproduce. They'll eat the cubs and repeat. So they're they're really pretty detrimental you know to the conservation of that species and uh and so it's i mean it's so necessary you have to hunt them and you take out those real old nasty toms who yeah you know so it's uh it's uh, i don't know man I, I love hunting but i had never done anything like that yeah man and that's what people don't realize that you know hunters hunters care about conservation and all that stuff too you know like i mean 
population control is important with deer, and especially with hogs in Texas. I know we're overrun with hogs, and they're yeah, it's a massive so. epidemic with hogs. <laughs> um, and I just right. somebody just told me today I was at the bow store today by my house, getting my bow set up, and um, and uh, the guy there told me that they just did a deer count in Texas, and it's like three point five million. So yeah, man. Even with all the people that are hunting, the population is still growing, so it's it's working. Yeah. Oh man. Well, uh, where, where did, uh, where did the gold chain cowboy nickname come from? I know you wear a gold chain, but it, was it anything more than that or? No, not really. <laughs> uh, uh, somebody had said it one time to me, you know, and as I wear heavy starts, you know, Levi's and I got my big old buckle and my Lou Casey's and, and, but, and so you just don't see many people that dress like that, that are rocking a diamond and gold chain. And, uh, sure. but I always just love diamonds and gold. Like, I mean, yeah. really like them and, uh, <laughs> and couldn't afford them, you know, when I was younger and stuff. And so once I made a little money and I could go buy some, I, I kind of liked that. Um, and I still do. Um, but somebody had said it to me one time. I said, man, that'd be a good title for a song. You know, the gold chain cowboy, <laughs> kind of like the rhinestone cowboy. Yeah. But I never really could write. I never really wrote anything that stood out or it never really seemed to fit the song. And, uh, I needed an album title and I thought that was pretty unique and, uh, yeah. You know, it's uh, it kind of stood out a little bit. It, I kind of shot myself in the foot because it's like the worst album artwork of all time, <laughs> uh, and it's just terrible, terrible cover um, for such a great album title. But I mean, it, it didn't take me down, so we're still going. <laughs> no, I'd say you're still going pretty strong, man. With the the arena tours and everything going on right now, it's it's wild just seeing how much you've grown over the past few years. Um, I was I was at I think the first show you did at Harry's in like 2016 or something yeah, like probably that. Yeah, probably something like that. Yeah. I think uh, I think like you opened for Josh Abbott Band or something like that. Yeah, sure did. Yeah, yeah, man. Um, went out to see Josh Abbott and I was like, oh, this Parker guy's pretty good too. <laughs> yeah, it looked a lot different back then, man. I mean, we were in a no. little we were in a little van and. Uh, I don't even think we had a trailer then and we'd take out the back seat of the van to put all our stuff in. We were just playing shows around <laughs> Texas and Oklahoma and I'd put out the limestone kid at that point and meet you in the middle and come out and done real well and high by the water came out and did real well and mm. um, I just remember, you know, when I was a kid, I just wanted to be a Texas country singer, you know? Like right. I never dreamed anything really beyond that. I knew George Strait and that was the blueprint and you know, you met him, right? a songwriter, and and I, I love George Strait, and I love John Mayer. So I always tried to kind of, you know, fuse those two together in some weird way. But, uh, you know, when we were playing those shows at Harry's, I thought that was killer. Like, you know, and then we kind of started selling out Harry's and selling out Cheatham Street and Green Hall and stuff. <laughs> and uh, that that was as big as I ever thought it could have been. You know, that was that that was like I, I had made it then. So to still be doing it and it's still growing and still getting bigger and bigger every year. It's pretty wild. And, uh, do you, do you ever miss those days playing in dive bars over an arena tour? Or, Man, I, I, I know there's, you know, I, <laughs> I do. I don't miss the way I was living back then. Right. At all. I was going pretty hard. Um, <laughs> you know, didn't sleep a whole lot and, and, uh, just a, a much, much different lifestyle on the road. Nowadays we got, all these buses and eighteen wheelers and yeah. catering and, and it's pretty cush, you know. Um, <laughs> and so I enjoy that part. I worked very hard to get to the point where it was like that. Right. Um, so I would not I would not want to give that up now. But um, right. We call them the van days and, and pretty often I, most of my band is still with me from those days. And uh those boys every now and then will kinda, you know, chime in and be like, Man, kinda miss the van days. <laughs> Well, in yeah, I guess it's just it's a different atmosphere playing, you know, in a bar for college kids versus you know playing in a whole arena full of people singing your songs. I mean, I'm sure, you know, there's there's a draw to both. You know, it's just a different. It's just different. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's so. I think it's so. You know, a lot of people aren't doing it now because people are going viral on YouTube and TikTok, and right. you know, you just don't have to do that anymore. It's just a different time. Um, mm -hmm. I feel like I was kind of one of the last. You know, Co and I and Flatland, and we were kind yeah. of the last ones that had to really go grind it out on the bar circuit and kind of make your name. You know, we had social media, but it wasn't like 
like it is now now it's another yeah. level it's it's you know consumes the whole world and um so i'm really grateful that i got to you know come up that way and and i wouldn't trade it for the world um i mean we have worked insanely hard i mean borderline uh mentally unstable we've been so obsessed with grinding <laughs> and and just wanted to be successful you know didn't want to didn't want to get to 40 50 years old one day and and it, you know kind of waste all your time playing music and not have made anything of it you know so we just wanted no to work regrets. hard to be successful and, and you know thank you god that we've been blessed enough to to do it this long and hopefully keep going but it's uh it's a grind man even even at the level we're at now you know and and uh have so so far to go i feel like we can get to a whole nother level than we're even at right now but um uh, it's yeah, still i mean it'll knock you in the teeth if you let it real quick <laughs> i mean what's it been being what's it been like playing those arena tours with morgan wallen and eric church and all that yeah that's it's it's good dude i mean <laughs> our headlining tour is 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 as good as it's ever been right now yeah I feel like our show's as good as it's ever been um and uh you know we're selling a lot of tickets on our own and then we get to go you know like this weekend we're playing Fenway with Wallen on Friday you know it'd be 40 50,000 people mm -hmm. you know and you get to go play out there for I mean it's kind of like a day off you know you don't have to be you're not the guy and that's true. you only got to play an hour and go out there and and you're playing for quite a few people who have never seen you before so like on our headlining tour we're playing for people most most everybody yeah. has either seen us or they're very big they're there to see us we're mm -hmm. playing with morgan they're there to see morgan and so yeah. it's kind of like the old days you got to go out there and, and earn it a little bit and you got to go out there mm -hmm. and put on a really good show um uh, and i i kind of enjoy that it's uh it's it's you know it's not as comfortable as as being the headliner and everybody being there to see you it's kind of yeah fun. kind of gives you a little taste of what it was like before <laughs> yeah it absolutely does we talk about it as a band you know it's just you got to kind of go out there and earn it a little more and you're getting to play for people who you know may become massive fans that night you know i'm sure there's a lot of people out there who are like oh, this guy sucks get morgan on you know <laughs> um but it's a it's an opportunity to play for people that love country music and and actually uh, love the songs that Morgan has. So that's they're here to hear those songs that they love. So hopefully they'll fall in love yeah. with one, one or two of yours, you know, um, at the same time. Yeah, man. And uh, so going back, I guess, to more towards the beginning of your career, what was it that really made you or inspired you to want to become a musician to to play music, uh, you know, to sing, to write songs? My older brother, probably more than anybody else. Um, you know, he's a really good songwriter, really good musician, yeah. and. Um, you know, he was, um, he was into like, uh, Pat Green and Randy Rogers and, um, Wade Bowen right. and Jason Bolin and Chris Knight and all those guys when he was like, you know, 15, 16, 17 years old. So that right. made me, you know, eight, nine, 10, 11 years old. And I was very, very, you know, I was listening to what he was listening to and I was obsessed. Like I was so into Texas music when I was 10, 11, 12, 13 years old. Right. And he was playing guitar and learning how to play their songs, and he was writing songs real young. And then through those guys, he found out who Rodney Crowell and Guy Clark and Towns Van Zandt and Steve Earle and James McMurtry are, and Robert O'Keefe. And, you know, he was really the one that, as a kid, he's like, these are the kind of songs we write. You know, he's like, this is what we do. He's like, we don't write, you know, pop country songs. He's like, we write real songs that mean something. You know, it's a craft. You work at it kind of thing and instilled that. You know, and, and I'm 13 years old, just like 100. Like, percent That's my whole identity. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's trying to be one of those guys now, and uh, and so that's really what you know started making me want to pick up a guitar and write songs. And um, you know, I would hear like I heard the song Ellis Unit One by Sea Girl, which he wrote about that prison uh, Ellis Unit there in Trinity, uh, which was just real close to where right. I grew up, and. Uh, incredible song but I remember I heard that when I was in seventh grade and I heard Enough Rope by Chris Knight and Framed by Chris Knight and, um, obviously Robert O'Keefe was a big was a big influence and, and uh, just these these songs and, I, and Todd Snyder and I just fell in love with them dude. I mean all my friends they all tell such the, great stories all my friends they all tell such Lil great Wayne and Drake and you know all these popular artists at the time and I was I was listening to Todd Snyder and Ryan Adams and Adam Carroll and 
you know, all these great songwriters. And I was just, I don't know, man. And then, you know, my mom moved me from Conroe to the Woodlands to go to better high school. And so when I started school in the Woodlands, I didn't know anybody. I'd grown up my entire life in Conroe. I did not know anybody. And so that was really the first kind of time where I, you know, I had so much time myself because I didn't have any friends. And so I would just play guitar and learn songs on cowboylyrics.com on the computer. <laughs> and I mean, I just, I remember telling people, I say, I'm going to be a big country singer one day. Like, I'm going to do it. And people would just be like, you're an idiot, you know? So <laughs> I'm glad I did. Yeah. And now they're coming to see you when you play at the Willis Pavilion, right? <laughs> yeah, correct. 100%. <laughs> I graduated high school on that stage. Yeah. Yeah, that would be the place, wouldn't it, for um, Conroe? Yeah. Um, I, uh, I graduated high school on that stage, and I remember sitting in the stands. True story. I remember sitting in the stands waiting for my name to be called, and I'm like, I wonder if I could really – because I already knew I was going to Austin. I was going to move there in a couple of weeks <laughs> and be a country singer, right? Yeah. And just had no idea what I was getting myself into or what I was doing. But arrogant, 18, 19 year old kid, you know? Yeah, right. And uh, I remember sitting in the stands at Cynthia Woods Mitchell Pavilion that day, waiting on my name to be called. And I was thinking, I wonder if I could ever get big enough to play here. <laughs> so it is cool to, to go play there. Yeah, I mean, you're, uh, you're coming there again uh, this year, correct? Uh, yeah, we played. Uh, that's the last show of our tour. I've been trying for a okay. few years to really end our tour at home. Um, yeah. So I can go play Whispering Pines and Connor Country Club with my dad and uncle and brothers and everything, you know, the day of yeah. and after. And then it's deer season right then. Oh, so that's perfect timing. <laughs> straight to the ranch. I always take all yeah, of November yeah. off. And, uh, mm -hmm. and we'll play a little bit. We got to play a couple of makeup shows that Wallen, when he canceled those ones back earlier this summer, he was scheduled to yeah. land on to yeah, the Minute Maid one, I think, too. Yeah. Well, we won't. We won't be on Minute Maid. So oh, okay. Everybody keeps uh, everybody keeps asking, like, why aren't you playing Houston with Wall? I'm like, well, we can sell that stadium out by ourselves. We can't sell out. <laughs> we can't sell out Fenway by ourselves. You know. So we gotta go play those with them. But Minute yeah, Maid, we can do that sense. on our own. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you already did it over at uh, shoot Reliant for the rodeo, man. That was... Yeah. It's, uh, NRG, I guess now. Yeah, NRG. Yeah, that's the <laughs> Same thing. greatest. I don't know. That's a great show to play. Man. It's a good one. Yeah. Why don't you share a little bit about your experience playing there for the rodeo the past couple? Yeah, of times, that's. Man. Uh, I mean, that's. I saw Pat Green sell it out when I was ten, eleven years old, maybe twelve. And uh, you know, just mesmerized watching him that night. You know, and he had these white T-shirts. He was selling it merch that, that my mom got me, my brother, that said, uh, on the back, it said, it has logo, Pat Green, it said, Texas singer, songwriter. And I remember being like, that's what I am. I'm a Texas singer, songwriter. Hell yeah. And uh, <laughs> and so to get to go sell that out and play it and do it two years in a row, and this year we kicked it off. We got to be the, you know, the opening night. Um, yeah. I mean, it's nuts, dude. You're in there in front of 70,000 people where your favorite football team plays. <laughs> and it's yours. Like when you play Hurricane Harry's, that's your venue for the day. You know, you call the shot. Yeah. When you play NRG, you know that's yeah. That is Get your the uh, your the calling the shot. It's just crazy, man. It's a when I step off the bus and I see the the inside of that stadium, I'm like, you know, <laughs> you can't you can't beat that. Then you look up, right, and everyone's singing along, and you're just like, oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, you actually can't tell feeling. if anybody's singing along. Uh, you have no idea if anybody is even making any noise, really. Um, I guess that's true. Yeah, you're just I, know, I never there, even thought of that. Like, <laughs> yeah, you're just up there ripping, hoping that they're loving it. And then you see the videos <laughs> afterwards, and you're like, oh, shit, they love it. So, <laughs> Oh, man, that's that's funny. I, you know, that's something I never even thought about, you know, because how could you hear it? <laughs> yeah, you're so far uh, away. But it's a, yeah. it's a lot, man. You can't. I can't explain the... The feeling, and it never really hit. You know, the last two years I've played it, it really hasn't hit me until I was walking out there to the stage. Um, like this year, I rode out in a Can Am, and uh, mm. and we pulled onto the dirt, and I saw the stage and the crowd, and I'm like, oh my! It's <laughs> just the most wild roller coaster you've ever been on. Man, I can't, I can't imagine uh, 
playing there, man. But um, what would you say? What's your What's your favorite part of creating music? Man, I, I would say just getting it right. Sometimes, um, you know, it's kind of, I compare it to like Kobe or, or LeBron or Jordan or whatever. Like, you know, they played ten thousand basketball games. Sure, but they only had sixty. You know, they dropped fifty or sixty a few times. You know, sure. um, now they won six. You know, Jordan won six rings, but he had some. He had a lot of games where he only scored fifteen or twenty or twenty-five. You know, and yeah. uh, had games where he couldn't buy a bucket. So songwriting to me has a lot of similarities, and and probably just about anything else does. But you know, some days you sit down and pick up a guitar, and it's like. You know, I'm I'm never gonna write another song, and then the <laughs> next that afternoon I'll write rest of my life. Uh, and for yeah. me, it's such a like I'm not an emotional person, but like when I when I pick up a guitar and start and make up a melody, you know, like rest of my life or have your heart again or um, you know, hell of a year or something like that. I'm like, it just it does something to my soul I can't even explain it you know like I get so excited and so obsessed with writing this song and, and but there's so many more times that's rare you know there's so many more times to pick up a guitar and it's like I don't even know what this thing is so um, <laughs> my favorite part about all of it is when is those days that when you do get it right you know um, so I feel like my my biggest songs are some of my kind of not as good songs um you know i feel like all the best songs i've really written especially some of the ones i've written on my own aren't the biggest songs so it's uh i don't know it's a crazy and, thing to bet your entire life everything you've worked on and all your future <laughs> on whether you're going to write some more good songs or not well and it just i i guess it's like you never know if something might resonate like, really powerful with you and then you put it out and it just doesn't hit the same with some with as many people Man, I, I feel like I've always had such a good gauge like even when I was a kid I knew hit songs and I knew hit melodies and hits really stood out to me and melody mm -hmm. is so important like as much as I love writing like creating it like just I'll just pick up a guitar sometimes and start singing a melody random and it ends up being mm -hmm. this big hit song it's like burn it down it's the same way like I mean, I was just sitting there with the guitar and just started singing Burn It Down over and over again. <laughs> and that's how I wrote that song. And, uh, and so it's just a, it's random, man. Sometimes it's good and sometimes it's not. And then the song, most of the time, it's like pretty hard. I didn't think that song was very good. I didn't think it was a very special <laughs> song. And that's my biggest thing, the plaque right there. It says double platinum. So yeah, <laughs> I don't have a, I don't know. I, I, I've never tried to write hits. You know, I've never sat down and tried to write a radio hit or a smash hit or anything like that. Because uh, it's got to have meaning to you, right? Like, yeah, you just sit down and yeah. and sing, man. What feels good and sounds good and sounds cool. and uh, You know, I've taken, I've kind of done some weird stuff on these last two records just sound-wise. Just try to force myself to do something different. Um, mm -hmm. and, you know, you listen to like... Uh, um, falling apart off of gold chain cowboy like it sounds like an 80s rock you know right big like metal guitar uh, uh, 80s guitar licks and it sounds like you know 38 special or something and mm -hmm. but I, I just like i was i get so tired of, of writing the same kind of songs i do sometimes i'm like dude i, I just give me some like hurricane was the same way david lee murphy came over to my yeah. house he had the chorus then he sang it and i'm like so, yeah, that's great. Like that's so different than what I'm sitting around here pouting over my guitar about trying to write sad songs, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, so sometimes I crave that. I'm like, give me yeah, something different. Um, and uh, but I, you know, I have one thing that I do well, and I do it a lot, and mm -hmm. and uh, it's been really good to me. So I try to stick to it. Yeah, and yeah, if it if it's not broke, you know, don't don't fix it. You know, yeah. <laughs> you're getting the success there with what's working but um what would you say is your favorite song that you've ever wrote uh i mean the rest of my life is certainly up there meet you in the middle is up there that's one song I've, yeah. I've always been really proud of um 
Uh, I just remember the way I felt the day I wrote it so well. Uh, it's like exactly what I was seeing in my head. I was able to put out on paper, and it was really it just mm. I remember it so well. And that was kind of my first song, first hit, yeah, you know, that the first, did well. First and we still hit. play it in our show every night. Yeah. Um, and uh, but you know, meet in the middle, rest of my life. Um, um, you know, best I never had which is the second song off this new record is a song that I really, we don't play it in our show. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was really proud of that song because the, mainly because of the line, uh, I made you believe my dreams were the only, only dreams we had. And it's pretty true for like my wife and I, Holly Ray. I mean, you know, our whole world revolves around me and my touring schedule. Right. And it's kind of, you know, I think there have been times where I probably, you know, just so focused and so head down hustling, just can't, don't even have time to look up, you know, and I've kind of been that way since I was really young, just because right. I was so desperate to prove everybody wrong. And I was like, I will not fail. I can't fail. Right. Um, right. And, uh, and so that's, that, I was super proud of that line. So that's definitely one of my favorite songs, but, uh, and then man, handle on you is like, the best country radio drinking song I think I'll ever write in my life. <laughs> I, I love, I love like the cleverness behind that one. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not really a big fan of <laughs> songs like that, but we wrote a song about whiskey and never said whiskey. So I thought that was pretty cool. I was, I've <laughs> always tried to stay away from beer and truck and yeah, um, dirt road it's... and the, uh, Hayfield or whatever all the, the buzzwords you always hear you know <laughs> um, and uh, so it's I'm always trying to I, I, I tweeted this like a few months ago but you know this new album Never Enough is the first time I've ever said the word beer in a song oh yeah <laughs> first time ever in four studio albums so and they've had you know three straight number ones at country radio and no beer, no. So it is possible. It is possible. Yeah, it's it's, it's something, <laughs> something I thought about for a so. long time. Um, <laughs> not that there's anything wrong with writing songs like no. that. Like I really do not. You know, there's no artist in the world that I hate on. Um, you know, because you're, it's a grind regardless of what kind of songs you write. You know, and it's hard work, and you're trying to provide for your family. You know, who am I to say your songs are good or not? I've written a lot of bad songs, but. Um, you know, just for the sake of country music, I've always tried to be as authentic and um, real and genuine. And it, that's just the kind of songs I like, you know? Yeah. I so. really don't enjoy happy, fun country songs. There are some that I enjoy. Like, have you ever heard Country Roads by Ryan Bingham? Um. So, so did Ryan Bingham do... Um, I mean, I know Ryan Bingham. <laughs> you ought to listen to his song Country Roads. It's like a okay. tempo, fun song yeah. called Country Roads, and it is banging. Harmonica lick right out the gate. I mean, throw your windows down tomorrow on your way home, back yeah. to the house, and play Country Roads <laughs> by Ryan Bingham when the sun's going down, and tell me you don't feel like everything's going to be all right. Um, but, you know, those, that's so I do like a lot of it, but. Um, it doesn't always have to be rip your heart out, sad, heartbreak, country love song, which I love those, you know, so, which is well known, but, you know, I don't know, man. I just really, I never really want, like being famous or, or anything like that has never, ever even crossed my mind. Like I always just wanted to maybe get to the end of the road one day and be thought of as a good songwriter and someone who did it the right way. You know, does that make sense? Like, yeah, really like, and genuinely, I've thought about that since I was 15 years old. So, so was it? Would you say that was your ultimate goal as a musician? Was really just to be able to do it and make enough money to do it as a living, and you didn't really care how big it got, but it yeah. just kind of took off. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I just never like. I've never been like I got to get this big. I got right. to this level. Like I got to get to be an A level artist. Like it, I just don't really think like if we get there, great, you know, mm -hmm. but. Kind of more like just keep grinding and see what happens. Yeah, and just ride the wave, man, and enjoy it. It's yeah. such a crazy life, and it's a life that most 
the vast majority of people will never get to experience. And uh, it's not always great. You know, there's a lot of days where you're, you know, sitting around, you're like, what the hell am I doing? Like, you know, you want to go <laughs> home, you go home for a long time, you're just tired, you're just tired of going on stage and screaming all night for an hour <laughs> and a half, you know? Um, but I wouldn't trade it for the world. And I've been so blessed. I, I've Every goal I've had is has pretty much been reached and, and surpassed by a hundred miles. So, I mean, so now it's just like, where else can we go? <laughs> yeah. If, if, dude, if it gets, if we get to go, <laughs> you know, play bigger venues and have more buses and more 18 wheelers and more people know who we are. <laughs> awesome. Um, but if we stayed right here forever, shit, I, that's pretty yeah, dope. I mean, it's like, yeah. Yeah, man. I mean, I, I saw that bus too. I saw a video of that bus on social media. It's pretty nice. <laughs> Dude, it's uh, it is it, it is nice. <laughs> I worked uh, I worked hard to to be able to do it and and have my own. Um, yeah. People ask all the time if I miss riding with my band, and the answer is absolutely <laughs> not. Um, I see them all day long. We just, I just don't see them while I'm sleeping, which I wouldn't see them anyways. Oh, but it's, uh, I love, I don't know, man. I'm a bus guy. I love being on my bus. I use my bus all the time, even in the off season when I'm not touring, I'll take it hunting or. Oh yeah. That's you know. better than a camper. Oh hell yeah. You can go, I mean, you got the bus. You, it's, you're like at the four seasons on the ranch, you know, um, I did that a lot during COVID actually. Um, yeah. Um, in one of our ranches in East Texas, there's not really a good house to sleep. It is, but you're in, in the wintertime, I'll do it because it's pretty cool. But in the summertime, it's, yeah. there's no way. Um, but yeah, I use it all the time. So that's, uh, yeah, might as well, man. <laughs> no, you're paying for it. Yeah. I, I'm sure gas isn't, or I guess that's on diesel. Mm -hmm. And something like that. I'm sure that's not cheap to fill up. <laughs> it's not. I mean, you think about it, my bus is $30,000 a month. Oof. <laughs> you know, and that's before I pay my driver's salary or for fuel or anything. Yeah, dude. So <laughs> it's uh, and we got five of them. So <laughs> it's um, but you know, when you're you know busting butt like we do and hustling that hard, like you're on the road so much, you got to make it as much like home as you possibly can. You know, you have yeah. to. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's why I like Hallie Ray coming out. She comes out quite a bit. It's like nice to have a little bit of home on the road, but yeah, you're, you'll spend that money every time to be comfortable out there, get good sleep and rest, and kind of have your space. That's worth it's priceless. Well, you mentioned uh, Hallie Ray, and uh, can you tell us a little bit about uh, how y'all met and where the song Hallie Ray Light, where that kind of came into and play? The, the song came from really our whole existence together um uh it comes from a buddy of mine gus west he's a real good cowboy out of sanford texas lives out in albany and uh, uh I, I was playing the coleman rodeo one time which i think is the oldest rodeo in texas and uh, out there in, i think it's in stanford texas and uh played it a couple of years you know and got to know gus who was he was younger than me you know, he's he was only like 20 when all this was going on. He was one of the book in the road. Right. <laughs> the talent for the road. Oh, shit. And uh, <laughs> so we were out there. We played it one night and we were sitting out there and he had said something to me like he had gone to Oklahoma State for a semester and uh, then come back home and then didn't, didn't go anymore. But he would said, hey, I met a girl named Hallie Ray Light. I think y'all should meet. And I just wasn't really <laughs> trying to meet no girls at the time, you know, not any like serious <laughs> And, uh, but I said, I love the name Hallie Ray Light. I'm like, that's gotta be, you know, it has to be in a song. I'd always thought about Good Lord Lori, you know, uh, one of my favorite uh, songs yeah. of all time. And so I'm kind of thinking the same when I heard the name Hallie Ray Light, I'm like, that's gotta go on a song. So I started trying to write the song for a little while. And, anyways, I ended up hollering at her on the internet, I think on Instagram. And she came out to a show and, um, she actually came the first night I was I ever had a tour bus, and uh, so I kind of she didn't stick around too long. She she took off pretty quickly, uh, didn't really <laughs> like the way I was behaving, and, uh, <laughs> and I just kind of I guess I thought I was hot shit because we had a tour bus and we were playing the you know 
whatever it's called, the tumbleweed in Stillwater, and whatever. <laughs> I wasn't acting right, and so she left, and um, I I started writing that song, you know, and um, I, it started on the uh, we were playing Jab Fest, Josh Abbott's Fest in Lubbock, and uh, Gus mm-hmm. was actually there. And our set got rained out. I'm talking about crazy rainstorm. And so I was on the back of the bus right. with my little guitar, picking around. I started singing, well, it's finally raining. You know <laughs> that we need it. And, uh, yeah, you know, it's good to see your face. And I started writing that first verse. And then it kind of, I, I remember I did a little recording on my phone. I got home the next day and. It's kind of middle of the day. I remember I was strumming and I started singing, Good night, Holly Ray. And I'd always, you know, I was always hollering at her, texting her, and I would text her, you know, Good night, Holly Ray Light. And so that's kind of where the hook of the song came from. And then, right. you know, she kind of threw me for a loop for about nine months. She wasn't really serious about it. She kind of didn't really want much to do with me. And, uh, you know, she told me I scare her. And so, you know, <laughs> that's why it says, you know, do you mean it when you say that I scare you? And so we, I was kind of like writing a song about what was going on and stuff over time. And, um, you know, I think we were playing again in Stillwater during Thanksgiving week. And uh, she was said she was going to come. And then she ended up going home and didn't show up. And like, <laughs> so we played the song at that venue and she wasn't there or whatever. I remember feeling like an idiot. And then, uh, oh no! <laughs> and then, like, I was like, "All right, I'm done. Like, I'm out. I'll never cut that song. I don't need, like she. She didn't show up. See ya." And uh, and so then Christmas rolled around, and uh, she messaged me one day. She said, "You know, you should come to Oklahoma after Christmas." And I was like, "All right." I had just bought a brand new King Ranch F two fifty, like cash money, bought it at the <laughs> dealership, drove it home, and drove up there in that. And so. <laughs> pull up to this house in Oklahoma like the day after Christmas her dad walks in I'm like this 24 25 year old kid in a $80,000 pickup truck you know probably looking like a jackass and uh but he's actually at my house right now um downstairs watching a movie and you know probably one of my best <laughs> friends so it all turned out well but we started dating on our first date and ended up cutting that song and we played every <laughs> now and then yeah well, it, it's cool hearing the the story behind that. Really, it it really makes a lot more sense, you know, hearing the meaning behind yeah. it. So that's cool. But um, yeah, every man needs a good woman behind him. I got married recently myself. Yeah, so. congrats, man, <laughs> dude. It's a it's a cheat code to life. I mean, you got to run around and do your thing. <laughs> you got to run around and do your thing when you're young, for sure. I'm I'm a firm believer in that, and you know how they really kind of like saved my life you know i was living real bad and wasn't taking care of myself i was on the road all the time and making a bunch of bad choices and you know same old story you've heard a million times but you know once once i realized the kind of person like who she was and i got to know her i was like you know i'll clean my act up for that so and i'm glad i did my my career has been a hundred times better i've been way more focused way more efficient worked even harder mm-hmm. had way more success since you know, I quit acting like a dumbass all the time. But <laughs> yeah, I enjoyed those yeah, days that... a lot. I had a good time. <laughs> oh, well, uh, well, maybe speaking about more of those days, but I know um, <laughs> you used to play with, with Co Wetzel a lot, and y'all met and became good friends. You played songs together, you wrote songs together. Um, you got any good Co Wetzel stories that you're willing to share? <laughs> yeah, man, I've got, I've got quite a few. Um, Man, what's the one that, that that won't give me too much trouble? Um, <laughs> man, one night, oh, uh, we were at we were hunting out at this ranch in um, in uh, Menard, Texas, and uh, there's like this little cabin on the river we were sleeping in. Him and I were sleeping in the twin beds up on like the loft portion of this little barn. Right. There's like eight of us sleeping there. We're out there turkey hunting. And uh, there's two little twin beds up on the loft above everybody. And uh, me and him were sleeping up there. Well, I had kind of, you know, called it a night pretty early, about 1, 1 a.m. and went in there and went to bed. And then about 4 a.m., I guess Co had been driving around the ranch all night, drinking and shooting stuff, doing the thing. And he came in there. And uh, I remember waking up when he came in and 
I didn't say nothing. You know, I just kind of rolled over, went back to sleep. Well, all of a sudden, he's like screaming bloody murder. And I mean, I'm talking screaming like somebody <laughs> is attacking him. And he's just, and I'm like, I'm looking at him. It's dark, you know, and I roll over. I'm like, okay, he's being funny, you know. But he was having night terrors. Like real, oh, real bad shit. nightmare. Well, this goes on for like five minutes. And then, oh. bam, stops. He's snoring. And I'm laying there. I'm like, there's no way. It's like, am I dreaming? There's no way this is real. <laughs> well, Gary from Muscadine Bloodline was there. And he had driven oh, from shit. Alabama like 13 hours to this <laughs> ranch to turkey hunt for one morning and one evening. And he was going to wake up at 5 a.m. next morning and drive back to Alabama. Well, this is wow. at 4 a.m. Gary's leaving at 5. And Co is having night terrors and I know Gary's laying down there he's 15 feet away from him he's just below us listening yeah. to him and I to this day I'm like I wonder how, if Gary ever made it home without taking a nap that day because I know he did not sleep his coat was literally <laughs> it went on for an hour like to the point where I was like we should we might like he, he was, and it was all in his sleep he had no memory of it he, you talked to him the next day and he just had no idea yeah he just like what do you mean what are you talking about <laughs> I'm like that was the the most insane, it's terrifying night of my entire life. <laughs> terrifying. <laughs> yeah, he's a he's a good son of a gun, dude, and and uh, I'm blessed to know him and call him, you know, one of my best friends. And you know, him and I came yeah. up together, and and uh, it wasn't always, you know, it's, it's people talking about you all the time and saying stuff online. And he was a, you know. He got a lot of kind of a lot of people talking shit when he first came on the scene because he was hardcore and and it was intense and yeah. and they put on a fucking show you know so yeah. um, you know him and I would kind of had each other there's no one else we really were close to that that had been through that or was gone through that or you know was on the road all the time or trying to be you know, just it's just a crazy yeah. thing to be doing at a young age and so we really you know had some really good long talks about that that have, <laughs> that have, that have helped me a lot I know I mean. I hope they have him as well, but, uh, you know, he's a, a good son of a bitch, man. I mean, a good-hearted son of a bitch. Loves a hunting fish hear. and a hell of a freaking songwriter and a terrific singer. Um, and one of the funniest son of a bitches I've ever met in my life. I mean, just off the wall, crazy funny and blessed to know him. He's a, he's a good dude. Yeah, I mean he's he can sing for sure, man. He can it's rip. Like, yeah, like the songs he's got out now, they're they're awesome songs. They're great. They're fun, but it's like it's almost like you don't hear the real like the the voice that's in there, man. Like the chicken, some man. of that old the chicken song. He's singing like full on opera. That's not easy to do. <laughs> no, and he's just not. in there fucked up in the booth. I think he did one take. <laughs> I think he made it all up on the spot. So. <laughs> crazy man oh, and I love his I love his little albums where he's got like the little commentary at the beginning oh, yeah. of everyone to the little intros it's it's neat but um yeah he's a he's a character for sure too um what's the craziest thing you've seen while you've been out on the road as a musician either at a show or just on the road in general man you know? I don't know I, I've been doing it a long time now so I've seen seen quite a bit but um <laughs> Hell, I don't know. I mean, one time, Co and I and uh, our buddy Jake Murphy and Dre, who's Co's tour manager, Jake was my tour manager right. at the time. Uh, Dre was actually Co's drummer at the time. Now he's a tour manager. Um, right. We had all taken a trip to Colorado and uh, rented this house and went fly fishing and stuff. We drove their old church van, old Co Wetzel church van up there, <laughs> and melted the brakes on the way going downhill on a mountain. Oh, no. Oh. <laughs> but we were sitting at breakfast one morning. And, uh, you know, in this little mountain town, and an 18-wheeler was coming in front of the restaurant, and I guess he oh, fell asleep yeah. or something. I don't know. But mm -hmm. flips the 18-wheeler right in front of us. And oh, she Slides down an embankment into the river, and, like, the cab of the truck is in the river. And oh, uh, Jake Murphy, my tour manager, never broke stride, ran straight from the table around the deal, slid down the embankment, pulled this grown man out of this 18-wheeler who was about to drown in this cab of this truck. 
It was the craziest wow. thing I've ever seen in my one of the craziest things I've ever seen in my entire life. And me and Cutter the whole time just sitting there like Like frozen. Holy like, shit. <laughs> like Jake Murphy hundred percent saved that man's life. But that was pretty crazy. Um but I don't know, I man, I've been I've been blessed, you know, I mean my I've had a I, I like to be painstakingly low key. I mean like mm-hmm. you know, I don't like anybody seeing anything but me really on stage and maybe hunting or golfing or something, you know, um, <laughs> I, I like to kind of stay out of the, the limelight and, and uh, just, I like to be so low key. And, and I think it's just a respectful way to go about your business in the public eye, but, uh, you know, so that's kind of helped me avoid, uh, you know, some pretty, some pretty close calls, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, we've seen a lot of stuff on the road for sure. <laughs> Right, right. Um, what's the what's the coolest venue that you've ever played at? You know, we just played Red Rocks this past weekend. That was pretty phenomenal. Truly, uh, sure, uh, yeah. just one of those nights. Magical, magical night. Just can't even explain how good that feels on stage. And um, we played the Gorge a few weeks ago in Washington. That was gnarly. Oh, really, really cool. Um, and then you know Whitewater Amphitheater in New Braunfels is one of my favorite places. I've heard that play. a lot. Yeah, I've heard from a lot of different artists that Whitewater is is pretty special. I love, I love, dude. Hopefully, we're not doing it this year. We're playing the uh, Spurs Arena, AT and T in San Antonio, and mm-hmm. uh, hopefully, we'll go back and do Whitewater next year. Yeah. Um, what's your what about your favorite live show that you've seen as a fan? Um. Favorite live show I've ever seen. You know, we played with Stapleton and George straight last year at the Kansas City Chiefs Stadium. That was pretty cool to watch that. Wow. Um, uh, I'm trying to think. Um, you know, I saw the Band of Heathens at the parish on 6th Street when I was old. That was pretty phenomenal. I fell in love with them. I actually just saw Gordy, their lead singer, at dinner last night, my sister's birthday. Um, he was sent to the mm-hmm. table behind us. Um, if you don't listen to the band of Heathens, check them out. They're badass. But I wanted to ask, do you have any um, other hobbies that you're passionate about outside of music? Man, I, you know, hunting and is, is my second favorite thing to do in the world for sure. Um, you know, I don't ranch near as much as I did growing up. Nowadays, I'll get back to that at some point once I'm kind of, you know, once I can kind of not play 90 shows a year, I'll probably start my column <laughs> cattle company and, and cowboy a little bit. But uh, now the, uh, you know, I love hunting and, and cars, man. I've got a pretty good car collection going right now. And uh, I've, my garage is full, but uh <laughs> I enjoy those a lot, but if I'm not on the road, I'm probably out somewhere, huh? Right. And uh, on the car collection, what's your favorite car that you currently own? Oh, that's hard. <laughs> I just I ordered it six months ago. It came in. They delivered it on Saturday, and so when I got home on Sunday, it was here. Oh, but it's a, a 2023 Last Call Edition Hellcat Challenger Red Eye Wide Body. Ooh jailbreak oh, <laughs> and all murdered out black and it's it's, it's in my garage right now it's got like Sweet. 23 miles on it so <laughs> after dinner i just walked that's Man. why i was late to this podcast because i was sitting out there and i was just i had it running i was looking at the engine i had the hood popped open and that's 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 okay that's that's fine. Yeah, and, it, and then i look at my <laughs> I, proof. I look at my wife's dad and i'm like i'm like what time is it he's like 8 58 i'm like damn i gotta go <laughs> Oh man, well, uh, that's that sounds like a beautiful car, dude. I saw you had a Corvette for a while as well. Yeah, I've got two uh, Corvettes. Um, I got that new uh, C8 uh, Z06, which is real, real yeah, cool car, and uh, the one with the engine in the back. Yeah, it's right? in the back. Yeah, yeah. The and mid engine yeah. and uh, mid engine. Oh, um, and then I've got another Corvette that's a C7 Z06 seven speed manual. That's real nasty. I actually drove it today <laughs> and. Uh, I don't know. I love cars and diesel trucks, man. I mean, love. I have a, uh, I have a fifteen hundred that's a diesel, but it's like a baby diesel. Yeah, like, like the box, the um, eco diesels they got now. 
Well, they have, yeah, they have like a, um, it's a Duramax, but it's just like a small little 1500 yeah. um, Chevy. Yeah, but I've yeah, seen them, man. They're baller. Yeah. Yeah, I love but, trucks, um, dirt bikes, boats, toys, airplanes. I love it all. <laughs> but um, do beans belong in Chile? It's the rich tool question. We got to know. Do um, beans belong in Chile? Man, I, I never mind them, but no, I'd like to have them without it. So we're straight, staying true to the Texas chili. Yeah, yeah. I like it, it, Like, I've had chili with beans, and it's fine. Like, white bean chili or something like that's good. But um, I, if I'm making it, I'm probably not putting them in there. <laughs> um, do you have any new music coming soon or any other announcements that you'd like to tell us about? Man, I've got nothing. You know, I haven't even – I have not written one song in, like, five months. I didn't picked up a guitar off the road really. A couple times I've written a couple of little things here and there. Um but I really uh you know, this this been touring and playing this set every night and, and uh playing these new songs every night and um, you know, when it's time to I I never have forced it. I just let it come natural. When my mind and my body wanna go write songs and, and go do that again and dig into those places and It'll happen. It usually happens when the seasons turn. So once fall starts rolling in, we we'll probably be some songwriting time. One, well, then you get a little bit of time off. Yeah. I guess. I guess you have to. There has to be time for it. You know, yeah, when you're got, out there touring, does. six shows a six shows a week and stuff like that. It's kind of hard yeah. to get in time to write. Too. It is, man. But um, I just want to thank you so much, man, for stopping by here today on the podcast yeah, dude. thanks for having out. me man i appreciate you uh being patient with me being late thank you bro <laughs> yeah man um do you you got anybody else that we think we should get on here next man i would get william out? beckman on here um i'd try to get zach top on here have you listened to zach top yet yes i am a zach top yeah he's as well. and william beckman as well he is nasty yeah. uh, both those boys are real good logan ryan if you've uh mm. You've heard the song "Cigarettes and Alcohol" by Logan Ryan Band. It's real good. So he's a he, he's right. gonna he's gonna have success at some point or another. And if he doesn't right. with that song, I'm gonna cut it. <laughs> okay. Well, we will. There you have it. We'll we'll make that into a clip right there. Yeah. So all those people have been invited here by Parker and myself. Yeah. <laughs> have them on, man. They're good. Have them on. All righty. Well. This has been the Red Dirt Aggie Show. It's a Texas Music Tuesday interview with Parker McCollum. So, um, thanks for stopping by. Thanks, Brian. Appreciate you, bro. <laughs> All right, man. Appreciate having you on. Bye.